Here's how to disingenuously argue for your political agenda. Cue scary music. Should GMO foods be labeled? Yes. Here are the top five reasons why. According to a poll conducted by MSNBC.com, more than 90% of Americans want genetically engineered foods to be labeled. So this is an argument from popularity, and while that's to some extent how democracy works, it's not how reality works, and it's not how science works. I also have to question the accuracy of this poll. When I went looking for it, I also found page after page of anti-GMO websites telling people to vote on it. An open poll like this would obviously attract the attention of a certain audience, and people who don't care about GMOs are probably not going to vote on it. 64 countries from regions around the globe are already accurately labeling GMOs. These nations support their citizens' right to know what's in their food. Personally, I think it would be wonderful if we could base our decisions in scientific issues on what the science says, and not what politicians from other countries say. Can we do that? I, w I would absolutely love that. Six different studies have proven that GMO labeling will not increase food costs. I really wish anti-science peddlers like this, who keep saying, studies show, would actually show me those studies. You have to realize that unsighted studies are just as bad as no studies at all. Now I can't check whether you're right. Maybe you are right. Maybe I need to adjust my opinion. But now I can't. I can't look at the studies that you want to cite. Because you're not citing them. Show me your studies. Please. All 64 countries that label GMOs can also confirm that no label change has ever resulted in a food price hike because prices on the market are actually determined by factors like shopper demographics and brand competition. The Grocery Manufacturers Association, or the GMA, launched a quick response code program to promote their GMO transparency campaign. These QR codes printed on food labels direct you to a specific website that provides further details about the product, a new promo, or other marketing ploys. Were prices affected by this campaign? No. So was it really a GMO transparency campaign? Of course not. How can printing four more words on a food label allegedly raise the annual food cost by $500 per family when printing sophisticated QR codes and maintaining a website do not? The GMA claims to be the voice of more than 300 businesses in the consumer packaged goods industry and closely related fields. Yet, it is nothing but a front group for junk food and biotech companies whose main goal is to stop GMO labeling at all costs in favor of profits. Wow, that was impressive. I have no words. It's an incredibly impressive level of misrepresentation of what anyone is saying. And internal inconsistency. Unbelievable. Nobody is saying that any price increase will be due to printing costs. Really? Why are you even suggesting this? That's ludicrous. Nobody is saying that. And remember your first point, that 90% of people want that label. Do you think they want that label just so they can buy the same stuff anyway? Many of the comments on posts about the poll called for GMOs to not be labeled, but outright banned. Labeling only being the next best thing. If there was any consistency between these points, then 90% of people would have a huge impact on the market for GMOs. Of course, I think that poll is bullshit, and most people probably don't care that much either way. I'm actually from one of those countries that quote-unquote labels GMO foods. It's just a small asterisk on in the ingredients list, and below it, clarifying that the asterisk means modified. That's all there is to labeling in Europe as far as I'm aware. I'm guessing that's not really the kind of label you had in mind. The illustration already shows a label featuring very prominently on the product. I'm guessing if you'd have your way, you'd probably also like to add a skull and crossbones here and there just for good measure. Farmers are informed when they are buying transgenic seeds, so they know exactly what they are cultivating. 
So if farmers get to know it when they grow it, why can't consumers read it before they eat it? Well, at least it rhymes, you know. If that doesn't tell you the serious business, I don't know what would. Okay, this is why. The reason companies don't want the label is because of anti-GMO activists constantly demonizing their product. In fact, the Flavor Saver Tomato, the very first GMO product that came on the market in 1994, used to proudly and prominently declare that it was made with genetically modified tomatoes. Public opinion is what changed all that. Proper species identification is truthful labeling. Historically, hybrid foods created through traditional hybridization techniques have been differentiated from traditional foods. Tangelos, a hybrid cross between tangerine and pomelo, are not sold as tangerines because they're not regular tangerines. The same principle should apply to transgenic foods like soy, corn, or salmon. Traditional foods are what people expect as the norm. Anything different from the norm should be labeled. GMOs should be labeled. GMOs are not comparable to hybrids. Hybrids are clearly different from either of their parent species. GMOs are identical, but for a single gene. Individuals of the same species are more different from each other than that. Hybrids, on the other hand, are a completely different product. It's comparable to saying you want to buy brie cheese versus cheddar cheese. You kind of want to know which one you're getting. This is not the case for GMOs. There's no difference in flavor or nutritional value. The only real difference is in the agricultural process, which has no influence on the consumer. An example of a major food fraud is passing off cheap fish as a more expensive variety by fraudulently mislabeling it. Even if it'll taste and feel the same to some consumers, this is still wrong and should absolutely be illegal. But do you know what's worse? Shopping for salmon, but ending up with GMO salmon instead. Why call it salmon instead of sealman? Inten because sealman is not a thing? An addition of a single gene doesn't make an organism in any way comparable to a hybrid. There is much less mixing of genes in GMOs than in hybrids. Intentionally depriving consumers of the right to know what they're buying and putting into their mouths, especially when it's something as novel as these transgenic organisms, is an obviously devious act. Any law that prevents GMO labeling simply legalizes fraud. Ooh, scary. Since when is it fraud not to mention what method of production was used for a crop? Should we describe every step of the agricultural process on the label? Maybe a science class on how GMOs work, too. Actually, that might not be such a bad idea. Anyway, like I said, the reason companies don't want it on the labels is because of scaremongering videos like this one. Bags of GMO seed do clearly display the modification that was made. For example, Roundup Ready. Because for farmers, that actually matters. If you really want to avoid GMOs so badly, there is the non-GMO label which now pops up everywhere because marketing. It's even on products for which no GMO version exists or on things that don't even come from an organism. Like salt. Holy fucking buzzwords. It's kind of sad that instead of items being labeled new and improved, it's now a better marketing tactic to label something old and the same. In conclusion, there are plenty of reasons to label genetically engineered food. This includes GMOs, Big Five, corn, soy, cotton, beets. Wait, did they just say beets while putting up a picture of red beets? There's no such thing as genetically modified red beets on the market. The beets you're looking for are sugar beets. And canola, which are used to produce high fructose corn syrup, vegetable oils, and sugar. These ingredients have long been established as primary contributors to diseases like obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Why are most GMO crops unhealthy choices for our diets? Okay, now this would be a good time to stop being so nebulous and actually concretely make the point that you want to make. Because, to me, 
that kind of sounded like you're implying that these foods are unhealthy because they're from GMOs rather than because they're sugar and fat. I Really? Is that what you're saying? Because that will be basically just utterly ridiculous and everyone can stop taking you seriously right now or, you know, 20 minutes ago, retroactively maybe. Personally, I would be in favor of actually going back in time and erasing any hint of anyone ever taking you seriously. The only other interpretation I can think of is that there would be some kind of strange conspiracy to use GMOs to mass-produce these terribly unhealthy things, which completely ignores how business decisions are made. When you're looking for a candidate crop to make a modification of, you're probably not going to go for an artichoke, mainly because I'm probably the only person who will boil an entire artichoke and call it dinner. Something like a sugar beet, on the other hand, is a very obvious choice because it's a large staple food. So basically, if you're blaming this on GMOs, you're reversing cause and effect. They are sprayed heavily with glyphosate, the active ingredient in Monsanto's iconic herbicide Roundup. According to the International Agency for Research on Cancer, Roundup is a Class 2A carcinogen. While Roundup is failing miserably to do its job as the wonder pesticide it's claiming to be, it's unfortunately succeeding in putting farmers and consumers unwittingly at risk to the big C. GMO labeling will accurately identify food products that are engineered through this novel technique. Now is the time to take a stand and take action. Support the GMO labeling initiative and reclaim your right to know. So first we had the implication that GMOs are bad, but now all of a sudden it's about the herbicide, which has nothing to do with GMOs other than that some GMOs are made resistant to this herbicide, but not all of them are. And the herbicide has been used since long before we had GMOs. That's why crops were made resistant to it, because it was already in use. So let's take a quick look at how glyphosate and herbicide resistance work. Glyphosate kills plants by inhibiting uh, 5-enolpyruvyl-shikimate-3-phosphate synthase. So we're going to call that EPSPS. EPSPS is present in chloroplasts and plays a key role in the shikimic acid pathway. Shigamic acid is an important biochemical intermediate in plants and microbes. It's a precursor for the aromatic amino acids phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan, which perform a range of important biological functions. Humans don't have EPSPS, don't use the shigamic acid pathway, and don't even make these amino acids. We have to get them through our food. Crops are made tolerant of glyphosate by adding a bacterial gene encoding EPSPS. The bacterial version of the gene encodes a slightly different version of the enzyme, making it less sensitive to glyphosate. And this works well. You can see in the untreated field that the actual crop is not even visible through all the weeds. So what about this claim about glyphosate being potentially carcinogenic? Well, it is true that the International Agency for Research on Cancer has added it to this list. First of all, let it be noted that inclusion in this list would still make glyphosate on par with occupational exposure as a hairdresser or barber, or shift work that disrupts the circadian rhythm. Secondly, the report that the IARC published to classify glyphosate as a probable carcinogen was so bad that one of the authors of one of the studies they cited came forward to say that the conclusion the agency had drawn was totally wrong, and that his study had shown no such thing. This is really quite sad. The agency is part of the World Health Organization and really should be expected to do better when reviewing scientific studies. I'll leave a link in the description to the article in which the author describes his grievances with the IARC's classification of glyphosate. The League of Nerds were quite thorough in going through the list of studies that were used to justify the inclusion of glyphosate on this list, so I will also link to their article and related video in the description. So all in all, I don't think labeling would really do much, but I also think it's completely and utterly useless. I don't think we need to pander to a certain group of people who are scared of what they don't understand. Though I don't think it would have much of an impact on sales, I think it potentially sets a precedent, and it could send the message that there is something significant about GMOs that is worth 
labeling. Well, at least it rhymes, you know. If that doesn't tell you serious business, I don't know what would.